a few months ago I made a video on how I was going to be using an art card for the remainder of 2023. With that year, and subsequently my full-time use of the A750 and A770 coming to an end, I've gotten a new GPU to test and utilize in video production. Meet the RTX 4070, a slightly older and much more powerful release in the ADA lineup over the previously reviewed RTX 4060. With 12GB of relatively quick GDDR6X and support for all the latest hardware and software features, how does the card accomplish the relatively mundane task of drawing triangles on your screen? And how have things changed coming from Ampere? Before we get into this video, I'd like to say not to forget to hit the like button and subscribe, so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Additionally, don't forget to leave a comment, especially if there's something I missed. I can't cover every aspect of the 4070 in the relatively short duration of the video. I more so wanted to break up my typical GPU reviews into a different style to experiment with how much information I'm able to present per given video. Without any further ado, let's dive into the 4070 and see how the card achieves the high performance that it does. The overall architecture of the GPU dies featured in the ADA line of graphics cards are pretty similar in terms of overall compute layout when comparing to the previous generation Ampere. Looking at the actual structure of the individual SMs and their execution paths, each ADA SM has the ability to perform either 128 FP32 operations per clock or a split yet still concurrent 64 FP32 and 64 int32 operations per clock. This allows the card to provide performance similar to touring in a quote worst case scenario where both the integer and floating point pipelines are hit at the same time. But this allows the card to really stretch its legs when workloads using strictly floating point arithmetic are encountered. In reality, most workloads take advantage of both execution paths at different times over the course of program execution. And the fact that the GPU can swap between full FP and partial FP in execution paths just shows that it's capable of providing the extra horsepower when needed without sacrificing other functionality. At first when we learned about Ampere using this approach back in 2020, I was kind of confused because it seemed like it would be a waste of die space. And while it does have a physically larger footprint, the performance gains are more than evident once I got my hands on a card actually utilizing this technique. Where Turing was essentially stuck executing concurrent integer and floating point instructions, Ampere and subsequently Ada can now provide double the total amount of execution paths without actually doubling the amount of fully featured execution paths, if you understand what I'm trying to say. This approach actually saves die space by cutting out half the amount of logic per individual CUDA core, building up excess area and transistors that can then be allocated to another process or compute pipeline. Let's take a look at the actual die configuration of the 4070. With a cut-down 8104-250A1 graphics processing unit, the die features 5,888 CUDA cores comprising 46 total SMs. While the definition of a CUDA core has changed over the years, it's generally accepted that the single precision floating point data path is the actual core, and the integer one is simply an execution port within that core. In reality, the microarchitecture is a bit more complicated than what I'm making it seem like for the purposes of this video, but if the 4070 was using the Turing microarchitecture, it would probably be counted as a 2944 core chip, simply because back then the CUDA core comprised both the FP and ALU circuitry. This change in architectural definition evidently allows the GPU to perform significantly better than without the changes, and is why Nvidia markets these cards with such a high number of CUDA cores. Along with the actual shaders, the SMs come with additional fixed function hardware to help accelerate rendering processes. The 4070 comes with 46 ray tracing cores, 184 texture mapping units in Gen 4 tensor cores, and 64 rasterization operation pipelines. The RT cores that come with ADA also come with an additional feature not found in Ampere that, while maybe not super useful today, will definitely provide room for additional optimizations moving forward that will affect the quality of the pixels on your screen. Specific features include the displaced micro mesh engine, which allows the core to quickly compute essentially fancy tessellated geometry in place of thousands of simplified triangles and bounding volume hierarchies. This not only saves execution cycles, but also a lot of memory since you aren't storing lots of simplified boxes along with your mesh data. You can instead pass this micro mesh data into the core, and it will markedly improve the quality of the geometry in your game worlds. The RT cores also have the ability to dynamically reorder shader execution to improve data locality and access patterns. What this translates to is the core being able to delay or move up execution of specific RT shaders in order to keep the load store units within optimal jump parameters. 
Sometimes there's nothing that can really be done to help access concurrency and keeping everything local and convergent. But when it can be, it helps to speed things up a lot, as the circuitry doesn't have to wait around for long jumps to occur. When it comes to clocks, the 4070 is pretty similar to the 4060 in terms of where it targets out of the box. With a stock base and boost clock of 1920 and 2490 MHz respectively, the card is way more aggressive than what the manufacturer has validated, and in reality things hung out at or just below the 2.8 GHz mark a majority of the time. This equates to a pixel and texture fill rate of 169 gigapixels and just under 486 gigatexels per second respectively at the more aggressive speeds, and is more than enough to tackle real-time 1440p rendering. This setup is also adequate to get into some native 4K if you're comfortable with turning down the quality settings a bit. The clocks translate to just shy of 33 teraflops of single and half precision floating point compute, which when combined with the 36 megabytes of total L2 cache allows the card to dominate when it comes to 3D rasterization and ray tracing. The overall memory subsystem of the 4070 is relatively weak when compared to the hardware specs of the prior gen's 3070, with 192 bits total clocked at 21 gigabit per second. This translates to just over 504 gigabytes per second of total bandwidth to the cores, which is over 50 gigabytes per second faster than the aforementioned 3070, but is over 100 gigabytes per second behind the 3070 Ti when it comes to overall bandwidth. The L2 cache can also help to keep more data stored locally, reducing overall access latency and increasing core occupancy. With 36 megabytes split amongst the 46 SMs featured, this doesn't function like a unified last level cache like AMD's Infinity Cache but more so enhances the individual cores by allowing them to maintain high instruction throughput per given period of time. Not much has changed though when it comes to the L1 data and texture caches when compared to Ampere, with each SM sporting 128 kilobytes of general purpose L1 cache and an additional 64 kilobytes of dedicated L1 texture cache. This probably enhances the performance of the texture mapping units, but the fact that it's split isn't actually unique to Nvidia, and is done by both AMD and Intel on their discrete graphics as well. Additionally, the card supports overclocking and actually has some room to increase the power budget. With an out-of-the-box TDP of 200 watts, this card is very efficient considering the computational performance on tap. The card itself only has a single 8-pin PCIe power connector, so it can't even draw as much power as the prior Gen 70 class cards. One of the biggest complaints I had about the 3070 Ti was that it just dumped out heat. The card itself stayed relatively cool and ran perfectly fine, but in the summer my room would warm up to the point where it would be uncomfortable to sit in, and I'd either have to underclock my card or just let my system idle for a bit while I went and did something else. I couldn't imagine what it would be like with a 3080 pulling over 300 watts under load. The 4070 thankfully is significantly more efficient in terms of performance per watt, and even when overclocked the card doesn't spit out heat like I was expecting it to based on prior experiences. After some tuning, the card was able to hit a consistent core clock of just under 2.9 GHz and the GDDR6X was able to hit up to 22 gigabit per second without much in the way of extra heat from the modules. This brings the overall memory bandwidth to the cores up to 528 gigabytes per second, which while it may seem kind of inconsequential, it will definitely help and is probably where I would focus the majority of my overclocking work if I was given the opportunity. Temperatures on the 4070's die itself never exceeded 72 Celsius and in the majority of heavy workloads, the card hung at or below the 66C mark. This is 100% acceptable, and is good to the point where the card is kind of begging to be overclocked. Even at the increased power consumption, the fans were also never audible to the point of being distracting. And keep in mind that I run an open-air system, so there's nothing there to dampen the noise coming from it. The heatsink for the card isn't enormous like some 4090s on the market, but it's definitely overkill for the power being drawn and dissipated. The entire back quarter of the card is all a pass-through heatsink, so the fact that it runs this cool isn't surprising, but it also indicates that you may be able to get away with a more inexpensive cooler than the Windforce OC edition that I've got here. So that was the first look at the RTX 4070. For benchmarks and additional content, make sure you get subscribed so you don't miss any of our future uploads. Additionally, let me know what you guys think about the 4070. Does it meet your hardware expectations, or would you rather get the AMD card for less when comparing strict MSRPs or even real-world pricing? That's all I really have to say on the matter. So thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.